Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Deborah Young from the RegTech Association. I'd like to start uh, the meeting today with an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today. I would like to acknowledge um, the elders past, present and emerging and offer a warm welcome to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, that might be with us today. And a big warm uh, welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, thank you so much for carving out some precious time in your day. Um, I wanted to give um, start off by giving a little bit of background on this um, Reg Tech Edge program. We actually developed this program um, as a face-to-face -face, um, initiative and we kicked off with a big event um, late last year in Sydney. Uh, and then we had a mind to take this um, globally. And so we did our first global event in Singapore in November um, in time for the Singapore FinTech Festival, and it was a great success. And aimed with that um, courage, we planned one for Auckland and London. And of course, they quickly um, uh, came asunder um, when the pandemic um, uh, hit us. And so we we rethought about how we could deliver um, this program. And so what we've done is we've um, moved the time of the program so that it kind of meets the opening of the um, European and the UK uh, markets to make this truly a global event and invite the world to come to us. And because we're on an online format, we also broke down um, the parts of the traditional Reg Tech Edge showcase into kind of little bite-sized chunks. And so this would allow um, organisations and regulated entities to come and um, participate in these around their specific areas of interest. So that is actually why we're here today. But actually what I wanted to kind of talk about is a little bit about why this is so important. And I think that doing events like this RegTech Showcase event are super important for collaboration um, reasons, to see the potential of what's possible, uh, to help people to understand it, to encourage people to trial it, to um, help people to get results, to manage risks, to improve transparency, and the overall aim is to get better outcomes for consumers. Um, roughly 100 of our members are small businesses and about 80 um, are homegrown reg techs, and they're playing their part in small business contributing 30% to Australia's GDP alone. And our programs support these small businesses and we aim to help uh, them connect with large businesses so that they may transact and get to commerce. However, there are still hurdles. And, um, you know, the many programs that we run uh, with the association, the advocacy that we do is meant to break down those barriers and address some of those hurdles. Um, government can be a significant buyer of reg tech as well. And today it was announced um, that I've been invited to join the ICT task force by Service New South Wales to look at making government easier to do business with by establishing a greater diversity of digital and ICT service providers and suppliers and to enable potential for increased spend on small to medium enterprises, indigenous organisations and startups. So I would uh, say that this is very good news and I'm absolutely delighted to have been asked by the government to join that and I will be an advocate for RegTech um, in that forum. Um, the RTA is an independent non-profit organisation for industry by industry and you can see on the screen right now the map of our members. These organisations are the organisations supporting the acceleration of adoption and creating a global centre of excellence. And this is an open invitation to you. If you aren't part of our flotilla and you're not a member of this association, we would love to talk to you, uh, to take you along this collaboration journey. As an example of some of the kinds of things that we're doing, um, is we, um, we are collaborating with the National Australia Bank at the moment. Um, we're getting focused around uh, some problem statements that they've identified and we are curating um, a program. And if you'd like to learn more about that, um, on the front page of our website right now, there's a news um, item. If you want to click on that news item, you'll be able to learn more about how you can apply for that program. But this is just one of many good things that are coming uh, your way uh, from us. Please reach out, subscribe to our mailing list. If you'd like to join as a member, there is the link um, on the screen. Okay, now to the subject, um, the subject of today. 
there's no doubt that regulated entities have, have financial crime high on their agenda right now, and in particular during this time of the pandemic. And in fact, according to EY, this pandemic has triggered unprecedented change, forcing major lifestyle adjustments, of which we've just been talking about, and turbulence in the financial markets. Financial crime across the globe is expected to rise in response to the uncertainty resulting from the ever-changing landscape right now. Organisations must work together to mitigate financial crime activity and adapt processes and controls not only to meet regulatory requirements, but also, also to support customers while protecting the financial system and minimising negative impacts on our society. So I wanted to welcome our sponsor today in EY. I've just used their words. And our presenters from a financial crime perspective, we'll be hearing today from Arctic Identity Merkel Science FICO. And we're going to um, tail the end session um, with a presentation from Visa, who are a global soup tech and reg tech specialist. Uh, today, we have with us uh, regulated firms, including banks, um, financial services, neobanks, industry associations, crossing blockchain, financial planning, financial inclusion, we have export agencies, universities, consulting and law firms, superannuation firms, central banks and regulators, world leading technology companies, and of course our fantastic reg techs from all around the world, 13 countries to be exact. Um, there's housekeeping on the screen. This will make for a very smooth running of the event if I could ask everybody to remain on mute unless you are presenting, in which case you can turn on your camera and turn on your microphone. We will uh, moderate the Q&A today uh, via the chat function. Um, we will do our best to get to all of the questions um, that are on there. Each presenter will get um, will get a short amount of time following their five minute presentation for Q&A that our moderator will, um, will work through with you. Um, this event is being recorded and will be available on our website uh, uh, following the event. And we will remain, once I call an official close to the event right at the end, we'll remain online for about 15 minutes if you'd like to stay on for some networking. Um, you'll have to bring your own beer, wine or coffee, whatever you'd like to drink, um, however. So it is now my great pleasure to introduce you to Dima Kachalov from EY, who's going to kick us off for today. Dima has over 18 years in financial services with the last five years specialising in delivering technology solutions to manage enterprise risk for major regional financial services organisations. His expertise is in financial crime, AML sanctions, fraud, regulatory compliance and credit risk technology with experience across the entire technology life cycle from consulting, strategy, architecture, delivery and operations. He's managed both enterprise scale technology enabled transformation programs and has led large distributed technology delivery operations teams to provide innovative, cost-effective, reliable risk management platforms within the financial services industry. Um, my great pleasure to ask uh, Dima to turn on his video and his sound. Thanks, Dima. Thank you, Deb, and good afternoon or good morning, uh, everyone. And thank you, Deb, for having he was sponsored this event and for having us here. So I don't want to keep everyone too long from the wonderful panel discussion that we have uh, as a core part of this presentation. So I did want to make a couple of observations about the extraordinary times that we're currently living through as individuals, but also as, a, as an industry as well. Uh, Bill Gates uh, once said that the a computer was born to solve problems that didn't exist before. And certainly the theme of today's uh, today's conference and today's panel presentations is about how we're using computers and how we're using technology to solve uh, problems, in particular one large problem that certainly didn't exist, uh, didn't exist before. Bill Gates also said that the world needs banking, but it doesn't need banks. However, as someone who's built his career over the last 18 years uh, in financial services, I wholeheartedly disagree. So when we talk about financial crime, compliance and regulatory reporting, the one thing that comes up is the issue of scale, particularly in Australian financial services. Regulatory compliance in particular and regulatory reporting has a disproportionate burden on small and medium sized banks. And just to give you an idea of numbers and an idea of scale, uh, as many of you are aware, the big four banks in Australia currently account for around 60% of market share 
with the remaining 40% going to the remaining 140 or so small and medium sized banks. And such a tilted playing field means that the cost of regulatory compliance and the cost of financial crime effectively favours those who have economies of scale, in which case it's the big four, it's the big four banks. And to illustrate that, a really good example is the recently passed Banking Executive Accountability Regime, or BEAR, as it's more commonly known. So it's estimated that implementing BEAR compliance at, a, at one of the large uh, large banks, so one of the big four banks, it roughly equates to around uh, 2% of total assets, whereas the cost of a similar implementation of BEAR accountability regime at a small to medium sized bank in Australia roughly equates to around four to five percent of assets over the next five years. You can see that there's a two to four times uh, difference in the in the order of magnitude in terms of the cost of the cost of compliance. So continuing continuing on that path, it's estimated that uh, it's approximately one to two percent of total employees at a large uh, at a large one of the big four banks is involved in regulatory compliance activities. So if you take an average uh, 40,000 employees uh, across Westpac, ANZ and NAB, that's roughly 400 FT or 400 employees that are involved in regulatory compliance or directly involved in regulatory compliance activities. And as you sort of go down into small organisations and small institutions, that number significantly increases and it becomes somewhere between 2 and 5% of the workforce. Now, obviously, the implication of that is that as the cost of compliance and the cost of doing the right thing increases for smaller and medium sized organizations, that could get to a point where those organizations are enabled to, to remain competitive and remain in the market. I see that has significant flow and impact for, uh, for the industry and also for consumers more broadly as well because of reduced competition. So what does that mean? That means that technology has a significant part to play in removing the human element and removing the cost element uh, and leveling out and evening out the playing field. If we look at financial crime in particular as one of our first examples and probably one of the one of the main topics of, of today's agenda, we should have a look at how COVID has changed the financial crime and the fraud landscape in Australia and globally over the last. Uh, identity fraud in Australia in particular has been on a significant upwards trend particular identity fraud that's targeting uh, government assistance programs such as the early superannuation withdrawal scheme. It's estimated that up until the end of June this year, roughly 24,000 Australians have reported their personal details stolen. And so far this year, a total of $90 million have been lost to scams. And $22 million of that has been lost due to identity theft. And both of those numbers are approximately 30 to 35 percent higher than the same time last year. If we move into more of the global landscape and the cross-border landscape, we can see that there's now significant large movements of cash around the world, uh, which are following the sale and purchase of either illegal or stockpiled goods. And some of those movements of cash and direct risk response to uh, to the panic buying and the shortages that we've experienced, not just in Australia, but globally as a result of COVID. If we look towards our more traditional fraud and digital uh, digital payments fraud landscape, you know, we've just seen a tremendous shift and the transformation in online shopping and online commerce globally and in Australia as well. According to Australia Post, in April this year, we've seen a number of online shopping records broken. So 5.2 million households have shopped online in April this year, which is an increase of 30% on 2019. The April online purchases this year were 7% higher than the previous record that was set in December 2019, which is obviously the December pre-Christmas rush as well as Black Friday as well. So it's an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary set of numbers for, for what is traditionally a relatively quiet period. And finally, the week after the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic in early March, the following week saw, saw a 28% surge in online shopping, and that continued to climb to being 135% higher in the week after Easter compared to the year before. 
And of course, what we're now seeing as a result is we're seeing an increase in fraud. So whilst the Australian fraud statistics are somewhat lagging at the moment, uh, we can look at the US and the UK, which have both seen increases of between 30 to 35% uh, in terms of dollar dollar fraud volumes, uh, dollar fraud volume increases compared to compared to 2019. Turning our attention to compliance and, and regulatory compliance in particular, but even before the, the current pandemic, uh, the world has been operating in a far more complex uh, regulatory environment since the 2008 global financial uh, crisis. The rising cost of compliance has significantly impacted the discretionary spending that's available to financial services institutions. So financial services organizations around the world have to invest more and more compliance, and that means they have less capital available to invest in other areas of their business. It's estimated that in the post-GFC world, compliance costs have increased by over 60% for retail and corporate banks. In a COVID context, internal risk and compliance teams must now stay on top of a compliance landscape that's changing far, far quicker than before, as governments and public health companies literally write the rules and set boundaries to protect lives and livelihoods on a weekly and sometimes daily basis. As a result, internal compliance teams must shift to a much faster operating cadence to support a rapid shift in the external environment and a shifting internal environment and as well as a shifting internal workforce. As working from home surges from pre-COVID levels of around 30% in Australia of people who regularly work from home, almost 50% in May this year, we should expect to see an interim shift away from traditional controls testing, additional pre uh, traditional premises controls testing, and towards increased monitoring and surveillance of employee activities as they work remotely. And of course, this has a direct, and direct reliance on technology as an enabler to ensure that that remote surveillance and that remote monitoring can take place efficiently and, and cost effectively. And finally, regulatory reporting. Firms, again, in a post-GFC, in a post-GFC world, firms around the world did not have time to focus on implementing technology to solve regulatory reporting challenges. They implemented manual processes and they literally threw people at the problem to address the increased frequency and complexity of new reporting requirements. These gaps in technology gave rise to heightened demand for talented resources to ensure compliance, which in turn drove up costs and inefficiencies have gone up as a result as well as swivel chair automation became prevalent across the world. This gives rise to a new concept of regulatory, which means that organizations are more and more concerned about achieving compliance requirements at a lower and lower cost. We have now tapped out in terms of traditional cost reduction options, which is process engineering, lean cost arbitrage and others, and any benefits from those efforts um, any benefits from those efforts must have been consumed by increasing volumes and complexity. Now, COVID adds additional layers to existing challenges. The fast pace of compliance requirements and the risk landscape means that senior management and regulatory reporting bodies must also accelerate. By definition, that means that human intervention must also reduce and automation must increase to reduce error and also reduce time to, time to reporting. And enterprise level during these times of remote working, delivering high quality reports becomes more challenging in remote working conditions where employees are not physically located together to, collab to collaborate on critical re regulatory reports. What, what this means is that there's an additional investment, additional focus that's required in securely accessing reporting systems and underlying compliance systems should increase security should increase security. And finally, COVID will result in significant manual and one-off adjustments to regulatory reports, including capital requirements, accounting estimates, as well as rapidly changing credit payments. These changes will tighten subsequent review and validation exercises, which must be offset through the use of automated data sourcing, data validation on modern collaboration tools. So during this challenging during these other very challenging and unprecedented times, we've got a great panel of guests today who will navigate you and who will take us through a number of emerging technology solutions that will help organisations, large and small, to navigate through through these turbulent times. We've got FIFO, who are world leader in analytics to manage risk, fraud and financial crime, Identity Advisor, who provides secure automated enterprise regulatory reporting solutions, 
and local signs who stand on the cutting edge of payments, cryptocurrency, and financial innovation to provide solutions to prevent crypto crime and the misuse of cryptocurrency. And this is just to name a few. So thank you for your attention, and we hope that you enjoy uh, the next 40 minutes or so of our fantastic panel. Thank you, and back to you, Deb. Thanks very much, Dima. Uh, well done. Um, it's now my uh, pleasure to invite um, Kimberly Whale to the uh, video and to sound. Um, thank you. Uh, Kimberly, a passionate humanitarian culture and change advocate, diversity inclusion champion and senior risk and compliance leader with over 16 years legal professional services, financial services industry and non-government government experience spanning Europe, Asia and APAC all with major global and Australian organisations, including banks, insurers, super, wealth and asset managers and multinational NGOs and law firms. Her roles have included regional financial uh, crime compliance officer roles for leading global banks and state convener for a global anti-corruption NGO. Kimberly has been a longtime friend and supporter of the RegTech Association and has the prize for the best four minute warning using bongo drums at a previous showcase event, which I believe she's going to reprise uh, for us this evening. So without further ado, Kim, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks, Deb. I, I dare say that des deserves a beat in and of itself. So thank you for that. This will be our four minute mark time keep when you hear that. And then again, um, at the conclusion, I will call time for our presenters at five. But thank you for inviting us back, Deb and Alison. Um, it's great to be here. And with the panel of presenters, I think we've got three big topics. And thank you, Dima, for that walkthrough. I definitely would love to see you go head to head with Bill Gates on the role of banks. <laughs> um, without further ado, I think we should just launch straight into it. Um, up first, we have have Arctic Intelligence, Anthony Quinn, uh, who is the founder and CEO, uh, and the firm specialises in audit, risk and compliance software related to financial crime, compliance and risk management. Prior to setting up Arctic, Anthony spent 20 years consulting to investment and retail banks around the world and nearly nine years um, at Macquarie, where he was program director for the AML and FACA programs. So over to you, Anthony. Thank you. Thanks, Kimberly. Thanks for the introduction and, and Deb for the opportunity. It's great to see some of our clients and partners on the call as well. So, so um, basically, Arctic Intelligence specialises in audit risk and compliance software specifically related to financial crime. And that's all about really solving two main customer problems. That's understanding risk and demonstrating compliance. And we've developed a suite of uh, technology platforms, which I'll talk about on the, ne on the next slide. Um, Ali, can you do the next slide? Sorry. Um, so, so our solutions are basically tailored um, to 30 different industry sectors and also some of the content within our platform is tailored to local AML legislation in a number of countries and we've got hundreds of different clients large and small across 18 different industry sectors and uh, 10 countries and we were incredibly proud recently to receive the Australian Red Tech of the Year Award. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So We've basically got three technology platforms. The one I'm going to showcase today is around AML Accelerate, um, which is essentially a cloud-based money laundering risk assessment tool. The, the next risk assessment um, platform is really an enterprise-wide risk assessment that's domain agnostic, and it's really designed to have a very uh, configurable um, platform to change methodology and so on. And then the third platform is really um, about audit and assurance. So it's, it's really designed for assessing the design and operational effectiveness of compliance programs and providing the ability to uh, benchmark compliance maturity. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to give uh, a few minutes overview on the AML Accelerate um, platform. Next slide, please. So AML Accelerate, as I mentioned, is a, a money laundering and terrorism financing risk assessment platform. It's designed uh, really for small to medium sized businesses in those 30 industry sectors. And it's really been designed and developed as a guided risk assessment, which is based on a structured process. So the first step, which is what's shown on this screen, is really around establishing the nature, size and complexity of the organisation by uh, asking a, a series of questions that relate to the business profile. Um, and then the next section on the next slide is to do with the, the money laundering and terrorism financing risk. So based on the platform, there's a structured methodology for conducting money laundering and terrorism financing risk assessments. And that's really done across 
six main risk domains. So the first is really about environmental risk, and that's all about assessing the organization's vulnerability to certain predicate offenses and other risk types. Um, the next category is really looking at customer risks, so looking at the types of customers, the locations of customers, occupations and um, exposure to politically exposed persons. The next risk dimension is really about business risk. So this is looking at the, the geographic footprint of an organisation um, where, where controls might be outsourced to third parties and in employee risk um, risks. The next piece is really around channel risk. So how do products and services get distributed out to clients? Is that a mix of face-to-face -face and non-face-to-face -to -face channels? And then you have product and services risk. So we have a library of about 250 different products and services. And this is all about assessing the, the attributes of those products that make them more or less vulnerable from a money laundering perspective. And finally, uh, we have the country risk assessment. And so throughout this process, it provides a full kind of audit trail to be able to document decisions, any actions. And that's key in terms of being able to explain and defend the, the risk methodology that has been applied to the organisation. Next slide, please. So after having completed the risk assessment, one of the key uh, requirements after that is about divine, you know, designing and developing and implementing a, an anti-money laundering program that's both appropriate and proportionate to the risks. And many organisations, particularly small and medium sized businesses struggle with this. So we've developed a baseline AML program that's been tailored uh, to a number of different uh, AML compliance regulations. And it's really important that regulated businesses really review, edit, and importantly, embed those programs within their, within their business. Next slide, please. So then the, ne the next uh, component is really around customer due diligence standards. So understanding the collection verification requirements. Um, and so these are again tailored by country. Next slide, please. The next step is all around providing uh, an appendices glossary of key terms. And then the final stage in the process, um, which is basically reviewing and publishing. So this essentially aggregates all the risk scores together and provides you know, the, the full audit trail around, around that. And then ultimately the um, documents are rendered into a PDF document and stored as a full audit trail. So happy to... Um, give anyone a demo another point or happy to um, answer any questions that people might have now thank you great thanks anthony perfect on time um great presentation i think we've got a few questions um i think the first one is how is periodic regulatory changes at both global and local level incorporated and what's the frequency of assessment so we so we have uh, some change detection monitoring software that we um, utilise in our business, and that essentially screens for different regulatory changes across different countries. And then we have a sort of a content management team that review those changes, and and in the back end of the system, we we apply those changes either into the AML programs or into the risk assessments. So there's really kind of a content mastery um, process that goes on in the background. And then what we do for our clients, we send a like a compliance alert notification once a month with the changes that have happened. And then we are able to publish those within the platform. And so the next time clients log on, they can see that there, there's been a change maybe in the AML program, for example. And so it just advises them to, to refresh and review their, their, their program to keep it up to date, basically. Yeah. And I guess you would see, because your client base, you know, expands, expands beyond Australian shores. So the data that you're seeing must provide some interesting insights, not limited to maybe competing priorities coming from divergent regulatory approaches, but also um, risk profiles. Is there anything that you can share, maybe some insights from what you've been seeing across jurisdictions or any correlation, um, for example, around product and channel risks and the overall inherent or residual risk profiles? Yeah, I think I think what we've noticed with our clients is um, doing risk assessments in a traditional spreadsheet driven way is quite cumbersome. And I think the expectations that regulators have um, in a constantly evolving landscape, you know, both from regulatory change and, and, and threats is that, that those risk assessments are actually done on a much more frequent ongoing and embedded basis. 
So what we find is, is our clients are really refreshing their risk assessment programs quite frequently for you know when they might be launching new products or, or going into new markets. Um, and so I think having that within a within a technology platform really provides you know some efficiencies in terms of audit trail and 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 uh, you know across the enterprise you know people can understand the process that people have gone through uh, much easier I think. Yeah, record to report the mantra. Um, perfect. Thanks, Anthony. I think we're at time. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kimber. Cheers. So up next we have Merkel Science and Ian Lee. So Ian is part of the founding team at Merkel Science and currently sits as VP of Business Development, um, having previously worked in the corporate and capital markets industry um, prior and is a strong advocate of a distributed ledger technology. To that end, Merkel Science provides blockchain monitoring solutions to help financial institutions and government agencies to detect and prevent the illegal use of cryptocurrency. So thank you, Ian. Thanks, Kim, and thank you to the RecTech Association for inviting Merkel Science to be a part of today's webinar. Um, so next, uh, Merkel Science. So we were formed in 2018, and our team brings with it a wealth of experience from you know, traditional finance, payments, compliance, and crypto. Although headquartered in Singapore, we do have offices in Tokyo, um, Seoul, and Bangalore. Next. So before I share more about you know, the kind of solutions we provide, allow me to first explain the issue that we're trying to tackle namely the rise of crypto crime. Next. As cryptocurrencies become more and more popular, what we're seeing is a rising trend of criminal organizations using cryptocurrency as part of the operations. In fact, just last year, it was estimated that cryptocurrency was used to launder over $11 billion worth of criminal proceeds. Next. Now, there are many stages of money laundering, and the reality is that, unfortunately, cryptocurrency actually simplifies all stages. As time is limited, what I'd like to do is just show attendees some examples of how criminals use cryptocurrencies to collect their proceeds. Next. Um, next. And next. <laughs> so scams are probably the most common um, use of cryptocurrencies as part of criminal organizations. So we've seen a lot of Ponzi operations. Um, in fact, here in Singapore just last year, a man was fined for over 100 thousand dollars for promoting an MLM scheme um, linked to cryptocurrency. So some of you might have been aware of this, um, the one coin scandal. Next. We also see very common exchange hacks, right? So um, over the course of the past couple of years, we've seen exchanges hack um, some losing over 100 million, some 400 million. And in fact, this is an example of one of the exchanges here in Singapore locally that was hacked just last year um, through social engineering. Next. Other forms of uh, crypto related crime include ransomware. So oftentimes we're seeing um, organizations being targeted where their data, um, their computers are locked and where the criminal organization may ask for payment in terms of Bitcoin. Next. And then more high profile cases you read about would be um, cryptocurrency linked to terrorist financing, right? So in fact, here are some images of different terrorist organizations around the world who use cryptocurrencies um, to collect proceeds in the form of donations or use it for buying and selling and trading um, with illegal goods. And in fact, there are a couple of these organizations that are expressly sanctioned by um, the OFAC. Next. In more recent times, we've also seen criminal organizations leverage on the recent COVID situation and a lot of the crimes that we're seeing recently involve um, COVID such that you know people would receive email notifications asking for donations um, to fund COVID, um, fund COVID relief, um, and actually all these are really scams. Next. And one of the more high profile crypto related crimes that took place most recently would be the Twitter hack, which just took place um, a month ago, where a group managed to hack Twitter and they took over the accounts of some prominent members and posted on their behalf um, a Bitcoin address to collect donations. And what's actually interesting about this case was that these criminals were actually caught through um, cryptocurrency forensics where they actually managed to trace the Bitcoin and identify the individuals involved. Next. And for those of you who are interested, um, please look up Merkel Science blog where we have done an article about investigation regarding the crypto hack. And this is actually a diagram that we've 
um, created where we actually track the inflow of funds collected by the hackers all the way till they cashed out at various exchanges. Next. So although cryptocurrencies may be a popular choice among criminals, there are many companies out there who are building amazing businesses and solutions around the tech. And it's our goal at Merkle Science to support them by providing the capabilities to protect themselves against criminals seeking to exploit their operations. Next. So very simply put, we have three solutions, a blockchain transaction monitoring platform, a forensics tool, and intelligence reports, which can be used to um, identify source of funds, trace, as well as the intelligence reports can be used for due diligence, audit, and a risk assessment. Next. Now, what's unique about our transaction monitoring platform, it actually combines wallet screening and transaction monitoring and allows our users to create custom rules within the platform to flag out suspicious activity and without needing any knowledge of how to code. Next. Together, we work with clients globally, um, ranging from crypto asset firms, financial institutes, government agencies, and research and technology companies. And for those of you who are interested to find out more, please do contact me, and I'm happy to show you guys a demo. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. It's almost like you could see my stopwatch there. Um, perfect. That was great. Thank you. Um, so we've got a few questions, and I think it does hit on a few points that you were making um, in the sec second or third to last slide around that value chain and analysis. Um, so, so does your solution support that chain analysis and maybe just digging into um, a few more of the tools that you're using, um, for example, to scan crypto transactions? Are you using OSINT tools? Sure. Um, so yes, we do do on-chain analysis, right? Which means that um, we are a data analytics company where we study these blockchain transactions directly on the blockchain. And so we're, one of the unique things um, that sets us apart from traditional transaction monitoring tools is that we're actually not reliant on our clients providing us information about their clients' transactions. We can actually observe their clients' transactions directly on the blockchain and build models to detect suspicious activity. Now we use a range of open source um, intelligence software, um, of which honestly, unfortunately, I'm not actually aware of the most up-to-date list, um, but if you would drop me an email, I'm happy to send that across to you. Now in terms of scanning of transactions with sanctioned Bitcoin wallets and devices, so yes, we do um, monitor different regulatory bodies for releases on new sanctioned addresses. Now, currently globally, the government that is most, I'd say, progressive when it comes to releasing addresses linked to um, sanctioned individuals would be the U.S. Department of Treasury, where they actually maintain a list of different Bitcoin addresses as well as addresses on other chains linked to sanctioned individuals. And I believe one final question I have here is, does your solution do a scan of dark web for identification of suspicious wallet addresses? So yes. Um, our solution actually scours both the internet as well as the dark web, where we constantly download addresses used by these people on the dark web for sale of, let's say, illegal goods, drugs, and services, and we extract that into our database, um, and we provide that all to our clients in real time. Perfect. Thank you, Ian, and thank you for moderating your own Q&A there. Um, we are at time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. All right, next cab off the rank, we have Identity and Ben Buckingham. Um, so Identity is a Sydney-based reg tech that helps reduce reg risk without replacing the legacy technology of the incumbent. Their Overlay Plus platform is being applied in a number of areas, including um, Austrack reporting, remediation of payments, and support counterparty assurance efforts. Um, so Ben, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kimberly. And thank you very much, everyone, for your time today. I'm Ben Buckingham. I'm from Identity. Our vision is to enable a safe, secure, and trusted global financial system by improving the integrity of data as it moves between banks, businesses, and regulators. And as Kimberly mentioned, we have solutions that sit over a, a few different areas of compliance, but today I'm going to focus on our regulatory reporting solution, which is tailored for Austrack reporting. Next, please. Um, most of you will um, have the background on Austrack and the type of reporting we have to do in Australia, but just to um, solidify that for everyone, there's three main types of reporting in, in Australia. The first is IFTI reporting, which is any transaction that goes in and out of the country. 
The second is TTRs, which is any um, physical currency or e-currency over $10,000 that needs to be reported. And then there's a third, which is called SMR, suspicious matter reports, which look at reporting when there's suspicion over uh, a transaction that may, may be related to financial crime. Next. Um, it seems like something that should be relatively easy for institutions to do in terms of um, doing accurate reporting, but we see a range of different technology challenges that impact how easy it is to provide quality data to Austrac. We often see information relating to payments sitting across a range of different legacy systems. That might be because of a range of different payment engines or payment systems that are, that are doing international payments. We see a range of manual processes that exist within the reporting process. Often it's still managed through spreadsheets, which creates some of these processes uh, and also adds additional regulatory risk we see a range of new things emerging in, in, in this space, particularly given that the regulations were written in a time that contemplated SWIFT being the predominant international payment mechanism, whereas now we're seeing a range of new types of payment formats uh, that create complexities in how reporting is done. And there's also um, new complexities that have been created by different types of payment flows through correspondent banking and other um, uh, payment outsourcing arrangements. So it's not as simple as it seems on its surface. Uh, next, please. And so what we're doing is helping financial institutions and their executives to reduce regulatory risk without necessarily replacing all of their core payment inf infrastructure. Next. How do we do that? We do that by taking structured and unstructured data from across the siloed information systems that exist with in an institution and create a complete and auditable record of, of that transaction. And in this case, using that to do uh, the complete and accurate reporting of that transaction. Next, please. So how does Overlay Plus reporting work? Well, we, we start off by integrating with the bank or payment service providers, uh, payment systems or um, financial crime compliance systems will capture all of the payments that are, that are in um, in those systems across the entire organization. And then we'll run it through a rules engine to determine what is reportable and, and match that against the Austrac schema, making sure that all the, the data is valid. If additional data is required for that reporting process, either from other systems, then we'll use that to enrich the, those reports with additional information. If there's problems with the underlying data, then we can facilitate remediation of, of that payment data, either automatically or through an exceptions queue, and then we'll manage the way in which uh, each of those reports go, goes out to Austrac. And then critically, we provide an audit log off the back of that um, that I'll talk a bit more about as well. Uh, next, please. So talking through some of the key features of the, the platform, the first is, is providing visibility to management over reporting. Um, this is something that's lacking in many organizations, being able to bring together all of the different payment systems and provide a common view into, into reporting. We provide a range of configurability uh, in the platform, uh, both in terms of the specific rules that are required for, for reports um, and for reportability, uh, and also configurability in terms of managing different types of escalation policies and approval policies for the institution. We validate against the Austrac um, schema. Um, and then critically, again, we provide an audit trail of all activity within the platform to show why a payment was or was not reportable that can be used down the track in a, in a subsequent audit. Uh, next, please. So just to um, go back on the, on the value proposition, we're trying to bring a, and create a, a source of regulatory truth for an organization across a range of different systems. We want to streamline and automate any manual processes that exist in the in the reporting process. Ensure that reporting is complete and accurate. You're not under-reporting or over-reporting. And then creating that audit log of exactly what has been reported and why. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Spot on. Um, great presentation. Challenges with Oztrack reporting. So a few questions, if I may. Um, first one, are you able to detect wire stripping in Swift messaging? Um, we can certainly detect when there's missing fields from a from a, a wire. 
uh, where there's beneficiary information that is not not present, or if that those fields uh, don't conform with the standards required by by Austrac. Um, but it depends a little bit on the specific example that you're, that you're talking about. But in theory, yes. Right, and the age-old question of the single golden source of truth on customer view. Are you able to create that through your transaction analysis? So the, the way that this works for us is we'll integrate with the, the bank or payment service providers customer information system or call banking system that, that holds that information. Um, we're not necessarily the, the golden source of that, but we can bring together the different sources of that data to create a common view of that type of information as well. Perfect. Quick fire round then. What APIs um, support the integration of your solution to legacy systems? So we have a few different integration patterns. The simplest one is just using a, a file upload uh, of, of, of transactional data all the way through to um, proper API connectivity through RESTful APIs. So, but we've got a, a mix of different integration options. Perfect. And maybe one last question. Um, so over the years, you might you must have seen a lot. You guys have been around for a while and and seen a lot in terms of challenges for for financial institutions more broadly across the industry and regulators to um, achieve this meaningful sort of reporting. What would you say are your top three learnings, and how has that um, helped you know uh, help you develop your solution to help organisations face into those challenges in this space? Oh, great. So I think. Um, there's there's certainly been a, a few learnings. I think in this space, scoping the right systems up front is absolutely critical. So ensuring that you have all of the right upstream and downstream payment systems and payment products in scope so that you don't have any gaps in your in your regulatory reporting. I think from a project perspective, this is often seen as just a financial crime compliance issue, but it's actually a, a whole of institution issue ensuring that the right regulatory reporting is done. So having a cross-functional team that um, that shows different parts of the organization and has executive support, we see is, is something that's really cr critical as well. And then I think the, the last one is overcoming some of the challenges that I, I mentioned in terms of identifying different payment flows, different payment formats. And that's something that uh, technology is best placed to provide a solution for rather than some of the manual spreadsheet um, oriented approaches that we're seeing today. Great, very succinct. I would uh, I would agree that those are some of the big challenges in this space. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Ben. Appreciate Pleasure. It. Thanks, Kimberly. No worries. All right. Up next, we have FICO and Benny Chan. So Benny is the Head of Compliance Solutions and SME uh, for FICO. It's an Australian office and he's responsible for Australia, New Zealand and North Asia. Uh, based in Sydney with over 20 years experience in fintech and the regtech space, including anti-financial crime solutions, Benny has assisted hundreds of tier one and tier two organisations with utilising automation to help achieve compliance. Um, so over to you, Benny. Yeah, thank you, Kimberly. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. Hi, nice to meet you, everyone. Good afternoon. You know, uh, my name is Ben, based out of Sydney. Uh, uh, next slide, please, uh, Edison. Uh, okay, properly talk about our company. You know, uh, FICO stands for Fair Isaac. You know, um, we founded in 1956. You know, as you know, probably most of the bank uh, they are using Fair Isaac risk scoring. You know, our revenue is about 1.2 billion since last year. Uh, we have more than 10,000 clients in more than 100 countries. Uh, we have about 3,000 employees and more than 30, 30 offices worldwide. Head office is in San Jose, California. Uh, in Australia, New Zealand, we have offices in Sydney, Melbourne, and New Zealand. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as you can see, you know, uh, for co uh, compliance solution, in fact, is one of the key and flagship product in FICO. We have more than 1,200. Uh, uh, compliance clients across the group. Uh, most of them are financial service institute, you know, no matter from retail bank, uh, private bank, regional bank, and also insurance and, and other FSI. Next slide, please. Uh, we offer a comprehensive and uh, compliance uh, solution full suite. You know, as you know, we provide the KYC, CDD for risk scoring and the transaction monitoring. 
and the AI technology and the wide swifting as well. Next slide, please. Uh, regarding the uh, risk assessment, you know, probably you can see uh, here we provide for the whole risk assessment workflow. You know, no matter from uh, uh, customer accepted, you know, or before the customer acceptance. Uh, next slide, please. For the first step, you know, you can see the initial risk rating. You know, for example, if a new customer join onboarding, you know, via our solution for questionnaire, you know, if no match or no risk, they then turn to uh, low risk uh, on the right hand side for transaction monitoring. So the low risk will we will we use the low risk scenario, you know. Uh, next step, please. Uh, next slide, please. For the second step will be the ongoing behavior or for example, if a low risk customer suddenly have an unexpected or unusual transaction, we will put it in the uh, medium risk and the medium risk of the skin scenario will be used. Uh, next slide, please. For the first step, you know, uh, if new information from the third party, for example, if the change of the beneficial owner or a new beneficial owner to be considered as a PEP, you know, or a new risk rating accept according to the PEP status, if it's high risk, we will put them in a high risk. So uh, even, even though in transaction monitoring, we will also put them uh, to a enhanced due division and we will use the high risk scenario to be used. Uh, next slide, please. For in behavior monitoring, you know, uh, for example, if they, any transaction is blocked or any fault uh, due diligence um, transaction, you know, we will, be, we will be classified in the high risk. So we also need uh, enhanced due diligence at this status. Uh, so next slide, please. Also on if uh, hit, you know, is hit to the OFAC match. And also if the OFAC match is non, non acceptable, we will classify to be non acceptable. And also we will blacklist the customer or block their transaction, or even though we will terminate the customer and close monitoring. So uh, we also would like to uh, introduce our AI technology. You know, we have a strong scientist uh, team in San Jose head office with more than 50 analytic scientists. Uh, in fact, our first AI is launched in 1992. You know, we also have a, a unparalleled access to the big data. We have the financial data from 9,000 banks around the world, and we also have 130 patents under registration under uh, FICO AI patents. FICO has been part of the machine learning and AI history since 1980s. Uh, since 1988 and 1986, we, are, we already used the neural, neural network to detect the card flaw. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we go to the AML uh, advanced analytics. We use both scorings. To, we use the soft clustering and flat score, you know, so this is uh, one of the key methodology we use. Uh, next slide, please. We also use the transaction behavior. You know, we, uh, we for example, if a can, you know, you used to, they want to transfer a certain amount wise certain channel to a foreign country, it will become a symbol. Uh, next slide, please. You know, we also use the Bayesian learning to unsupervised and learning tests from million customer based on their data. Uh, next slide, please. You know, for for the clustering archetypes, you know, we use the misalignment with cluster is suspicious. For example, if based on scenario one, uh, we also, for example, if an existing customer moves out uh, from a cluster, for example, if a music card account is being activated, uh, scenario two, if a customer moves from one cluster to another, for example, if a student who got a job who joined to a, a, a who joined to an office to work as a clerk. This is a kind of misalignment cluster. Next slide, please. We also can see, you know, if you use the rules, you know, we can see uh, they are the rules. Uh, they cannot detect some unsus unsuspicious activities. Uh, next slide, please. So probably uh, with the last one, we will talk about the ACM. We are about the enterprise uh, case management. This is a whole platform to for the SMR. We talk about the regulatory reporting. So this is kind of like uh, the whole ACM enterprise case management to help you to for regulatory uh, uh, reporting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Benny. A little bit over, but that was a great presentation. So we won't we won't fault you on that one. Um, yeah. Thank you again. So got a couple of questions. Uh, first one: How interpretable is the the AI models that you're using within your solution? Oh, okay. We used to uh, we use two models. You know, one is the basic uh, Bayesian uh, network, neural network, and the other one is the 
soft clustering and clustering network, you know, so uh, which is uh, two major network you use. Uh, for example, we also have the re reasonable, uh, reasonable uh, uh, code to explain uh, our AI, you know, to, uh, to support what kind of suspicious activity can be detected, you know. As you know, the uh, rule-based uh, scenario has been in the market for a decade. You know, there's no such enhancement and improvement. So in fact, AI can detect the suspicious activities, for, for instance, like five months in advance or two months in advance. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And maybe just one more quick question. Um, yep. Based on following on from Dima's introduction as well, how how has your solution helped to to reduce the cost of compliance, really? Or what what are the outcomes in terms of the savings you've delivered for your clients? Yeah, it's a good question. In fact, as you know, most of the financial uh, institution they use the uh, rule base uh, for a long time for a decade. As I mentioned before, the rule base uh, hasn't been. Uh, enhanced or improved for a long time. There are two disadvantages of this. They tend to produce a higher percentage of false positive, you know, and only they detect what you're looking for. You know, if you add the AI by using the soft clustering with alignment score, you know, the, the, they, uh, the cluster, customer based on the behavior, based on multiple dimension, you know, we can uh, detect the suspicious activities in advance. Also, on the other hand, we use the AML threat score, you know, based on the past patterns and past score or SML. Also, we can detect, you know, what kind of activities they are look, uh, they are, they will be moving to. So AI can detect the patterns you are looking, you are not looking for, and AI promises to reduce the number of false positive. Perfect. Thank you, Benny. Okay. Close it there. Last but not least, Visor Dermot McCain. Uh, Dermot has recently been appointed as the head of APAC, reg reporting for Visa and tasked with scaling their operations in the region. And prior to that, Dermot was co-founder of a reg tech, uh, an Irish reg tech, Priviti, <laughs> which specialised in consent management and has extensive executive career uh, in technology organisations, including IBM and Optus. So without further ado, over to you, Dermot. Thank you. Thanks, Kimberly, and good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to the previous presenters, sponsors, and of course to RegTech Australia for making this event happen. Uh, great opening comments from Deborah, and, and also really great insight on, on some of the global challenges in regulatory reporting from Dima. So thank you for that. Thank you also to those of you who are attending in your homes all over the world. Appreciate it. It's a difficult time for many of us, so my goal is to make the next five minutes as helpful and informative as possible. Um, uh, look, it's hard to find anything funny in compliance or COVID at the moment, but I'm sure this point isn't lost on any of us. Our compliant obligations don't wane whilst we're working from home or suffering under a pandemic, and, and if anything, they're heightened. So indeed, when future generations are going to ask us, what did we do during COVID, we need to have a good response. Well, our regulator and Visor's first client in Australia, in Australia, APRA, has responded well, and they've exercised their primary responsibility, and they've maintained the safety, stability, and the resilience of Australia's financial system, and they need to be commended for this. Some examples of what they've done, they've adjusted bank capital expectations, they've delayed some of the 2020 supervision and policy priorities, they've changed the reporting obligations for some of the regulated entities, and they've temporarily suspended the issuing of new licenses. Advisor, we're going to remember 2020 as the year we launched new approaches to regulatory reporting in multiple jurisdictions around the world, including for APRA and the MAL. Previous and many current approaches for regulatory reporting are both costly for both regulators and regulated entities, and manual approaches are just no longer feasible, and we Dima spoke about that before. As such, we've been working really hard with APRA uh, and many of the banks and our partners to digitize and streamline the demands on regulatory reporting. Uh, next slide, please. At Visor, we're actually celebrating our 20th birthday this year. We operate across 31 jurisdictions worldwide. This gives regulators and regulated entities a unique advantage when working with us as they get to leverage the insights and the expertise that we've accumulated, having been deployed across 25 global regulators, 19 global tax authorities, and 30 banks worldwide. So we definitely take a think global, act local approach. And as such, since APRA awarded the contract advisor to deliver the D2A replacement program, our APRA Connect early last year, we've gone into overdrive now in Australia, looking to establish and scale our business here. We've been making great progress and have seen the industry really rally behind the idea of partnering with the organization that is delivering one of the most significant regulatory transformation programs to be undertaken in this country to date. Next slide, please. 
Um, look, here we have just a very small snapshot of some of the regulators and the entities that we already work with around the world. In Singapore, we launched the Visor Reporting API, which pulls data from Excel, validates it against the regulator's rules, and produces the XML file for submission. Thus, we have completely eliminated the duplication of effort for over 30 banks in Singapore and dramatically reduced the risk and costs associated with erroneous data. Um, in addition, we've got some great accolades uh, from Central Banking, Global RegTech Provider of the Year for the last two years running. And importantly, we've also been awarded Deloitte's Best Ma uh, Managed Company for, for the last four years, which is a testament not only to our business performance and a great team, but also our excellence in delivery and execution. Next slide, please. Um, look, I mentioned our goal when launching Visor Reporting directly to reporting entities is to afford those entities with the same benefits and more that their regulators have accepted. So that overall, as an industry, we can raise the compliance bar and simultaneously reduce the headaches associated with compliance reporting. And we do this by providing real-time updates with the latest data models, logic, and the rules published by the regulator. We put the important ability to pre-validate your submissions to reduce any rework and the frustration experience when regulators respond with queries or return your submissions once it fails their internal uh, plausibility checks. By working with Visor, we're going to help you ensure that you get it right first time by being on the same platform as the regulator. Naturally, with the elimination of duplication of effort, we are reducing significant costs and manual processes and resources, but also eliminating the risk of massive fines associated with erroneous, incomplete, or large filings, which are, have been significant in Australia. Um, important to note that Visor Platform does not require brain surgery for your organization and can be integrated via our RESTful APIs into your existing system. Um, Notice, noted your, your drum. Whilst we don't have time for demo today, what you will see when we do demo is a solution that looks like this. Um, here we show you how the machine readable reporting requirements will stay in sync with your rules, guarantee your submissions are valid before you submit them to APRA. The metadata is then augmented by Visor, and our platform understands and interprets it natively, allowing you to prepare different reports, generate XSVs, and provide a full audit trail. The reports are then uh, populated with the data, pre validated against APRA's rules, and we guarantee the submission. Next slide, please. And that's it. Look, thank you. Now, next slide, please, Alison. Thank you. I hope this is uh, informative. Um, as I mentioned, we're looking for help ourselves, and we've got an event coming up in two weeks. So if you or someone you know would like to hear more about how we implemented our supervisory technology solution for APRA and for the Monterey Authority of Singapore, or you'd like to understand more of how Visor can help you with your clients or with, or with your APRA Connect com compliance reporting, then please contact us via your preferred channel, and we look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks, Dermot. Um, so we can settle into uh, some questions and thanks everyone for staying on the line. Appreciate your patience. Um, so maybe just a broad brush then in terms of what are you seeing? What are the types of changes firms can expect to see in re reporting requirements over the next few years? Yeah, so um, I think, uh, look, globally we're seeing a lot of um, trying to standardise on a lot of the the reporting, um, looking to uh, address, I guess, some of the points that Dimit said. You know, we're seeing a significant increase in compliance costs, the FTEs that are required to do it. A lot of people are particularly prevalent, not so much with the large institutions, but smaller, medium banks are really struggling. They're having to put on more resources, significant manual uses of reports. And that's probably where we're seeing the biggest shift um, as we're working with the regulators and we have all of the logic. Um, it's probably driving a lot more... Um, interest in, in an automated uh, regulatory reporting solution. Okay, great. Right. Um, and I guess, how, how engaged have the regulators been in, in developing, you know, your solution and, and on an ongoing basis? And have you been seeing like more of a return on investment from, from their engagement to enhance the quality and, and compliance? Oh, uh, look, absolutely. There's been a lot of engagement um, right across the industry, not just with regulators, but also um, risk officers, compliance officers. And I think it's probably reflective of the increased burden on regulatory reporting. You know, we've, I mentioned it's quite a transformative solution that we've put in place with both with the MAS and also for Africa Connect. And, that, and once Africa Connect is, is, has been released, that will be, you know, the most significant transformation in the industry in Australia. So we're getting a lot of people who want to be able to leverage the logic and the plausibility checks and the, and the extra um, components that we've built and adapted for the local regulator in Australia and in Singapore. Um, but it's really driven by the significant change in demand uh, on, and the pressure that's on every entity in, in terms of compliance reporting. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and no doubt an opportunity to really shift industry practice in this space as a result. Cool. All right. Well, we so are at. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, I, I was just going to say it, it. I mean, it's for the good of everybody. If we have a good and consistent compliance reporting and it's, and it's not erroneous, then the idea is it's going to benefit the whole industry and the consumers. Yeah. Um, so I think we're at time there. Thank you again, Dermot, and to all of our presenters today. I might hand back to Deb. Thanks very much, um, Kimberly. Um, so I am aware that we ran a little bit over time, and thank you, Dermot. I appreciate it's not always easy to go last. Um, so thanks very much for that. But I think yeah, you've got a demo out of that, so that's uh, that's that's excellent uh, excellent news. Um, so I wanted to uh, just uh, kind of finish off by thanking Dima and Kimberly from EY. Um, they did that with great aplomb and we appreciate uh, Kimberly and her bongo drums, very effective. Uh, but I also wanted to thank Anthony, Ian, Ben, Benny and uh, finally Dermot uh, for their contributions today. Um, in us coming together like this really helps us to move the dial and see the potential and the opportunity. So thank you all very much. Um, you'll notice on the screen, apart from uh, Dermot gave a free plug to their event of which, um, Dermot, if you want to put that in the chat, if there's a link or something you can put in the chat there, uh, but otherwise we can send that out um, post, um, post event uh, to people. But we've got a RegTech open for business on the 22nd of September, which is actually going to be a little bit of a, a shift in gears for us. We're going to actually look at some an economic outlook and some mega trends in light of the pandemic. And I'm um, delighted to have um, uh, been able to collaborate with Austrade and Data61 to present that. So that's um, that's in September. And then on the 18th of March, 2021, of course, is our Accelerate RegTech event. Um, and uh, stay tuned, uh, we, we had our first committee meeting today, so there's very exciting things in store. So I'll call an official close uh, to the event. Thank you very much for coming. And for those of you that would like to stay on the line, we'll, we'll hang around for another 15 minutes. So feel free to, to turn your cameras on, your sound on and come say hi. Uh, that's great, thank you. Well done, guys. <laughs>